Hebrews 12, verse 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire into the blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him, who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth? But now he has promised, saying, Yet once I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of the things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for God is a consuming fire. Well, we've been talking about um, these different things that the book of Hebrews is bringing out. We've been looking here since we've made it. Well, let's go back to the end of Hebrews 10, right? The end of Hebrews 10 basically said, the just shall live by faith. Now, what does that mean? Well, we've been studying in Romans, right, that we are justified by faith alone and Christ alone. Right? We believe that doctrine, that is central to salvation. But the Bible doesn't stop there. It says that people who live or who have been saved by God's grace, that by their faith in Christ Jesus, they're going to live by that faith. The just ones, those who have been declared righteous by God, shall live by faith. Now, the question becomes, what does that really mean? To live by faith is kind of abstract if you just left it there. Because some people would say, well, I'm going to live by faith to this extent. And some would say, well, no, I'm going to live to that extent. Well, the author doesn't leave you guessing because then he gives you Hebrews 11. And in Hebrews 11, we have all the Old Testament saints that he uses to say, this is how far. This is what it means to live by faith. He doesn't stop there, does he? He comes into chapter 12 and he points you to Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the author and perfecter, the author and finisher of our faith. And then we see that we're to run a race, according to the author of Hebrews here in early, uh, early in, in Hebrews 12. In that, when you prepare for this race, a runner must discipline, train himself, right? And then we have this great section buried in Samson here of what it means to be disciplined and trained by God. The discipline of God is not a manifestation that God doesn't love you. It's the very opposite. What is the mark of sonship according to the scriptures? What is, what is the mark that you belong to God and God is your father? It's that he disciplines his children. And what we think is that when I'm being disciplined by God, many people are tempted to say, well, where is he? God is never closer to you than when he's disciplining you. Children, I know this is hard for you to understand, but your father and your mother are never closer to you than when they're disciplining you. The discipline of a father to a child is not a manifestation that they hate you. It's a manifestation that they love you. And where do we learn this? We learn this from our Heavenly Father. Well, it's not enough for a runner to be trained. If any of you have ever been in athletics, you need more than to train, you need a strategy. And what's the strategy? Well, the author tells you, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. There's the strategy. We're to pursue peace and holiness. We don't pursue peace at the expense of holiness. And to pursue holiness doesn't mean you have to be a knucklehead, right? You remember what Luke says about Jesus? He found favor with both God and man. Sometimes we believe this dichotomy. To have favor with men, we, we can't have favor with God. Or to have favor with God, we can't have favor with men. What we need to understand is that Jesus Christ grew in both favor of God and man. You see, being a jerk is not a gift of the Spirit. Is it? But we've never been called to compromise the truth. We speak that truth in love to all those we come into contact with. Now, as we come here... We left off last week where we looked at this apostasy section and we saw how he used the example of Esau. And apostasy is a real threat to those in the church. Remember, this is written to people who are in the church. Due to persecution, there were many who were threatening to apostatize and go back to Judaism. And so the author of Hebrews picks up this theme. And I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. 
So the author who just finished warning about apostasy, and we looked at that last week, remember an apostate is one who has received light, but they've not received any light. They've professed, but they don't possess the Spirit of God. They've come close. They've been exposed to all kinds of, of things, and, and that's why the writer of Peter, in 2 Peter 2, would say, you know, it'd been better for you to have not to have known, than to have known and then to turn back. And so apostasy is a real thing. Apostasy is warned against throughout the New Testament, and, you know, they use a lot of Old Testament examples to drive home that point. Well, this morning, the writer of Hebrews is reminding these readers, these persecuted Christians, who some were threatening to go back to Judaism to try to get the pressure of persecution off of them. He's reminding them that when you give up Mount Zion, where are you going? Well, you're going back to Mount Sinai. And he's going to contrast Mount Sinai with Mount Zion. Do you remember the theme of the book of Hebrews? The theme of the book of Hebrews is the supremacy of Christ, the superiority of the new covenant that Jesus has brought in. A covenant, remember, is a bond that God makes with his people. And this is how he establishes his relationships. All relationships with, between God and his creation is through a covenant. And so in the covenant, God establishes the stipulations, the requirements of the relationship. And so what we learn when we read through the Bible is that Jesus came to fulfill and establish all the Old Testament promises. And so we live under this new covenant. And this covenant is absolutely superior to the old covenant. And I hope with that you can begin to understand why the author of Hebrews jumps from apostasy to verse 18. He's telling them when you turn from the sweetness of Christ, this is where you're going back to. And when you go back to the old covenant system, there is no more sacrifice for sin. All right. Now, it's important to understand these Jewish Christians were threatening to go back to Judaism. They're trying to put themselves back under the types and shadows that the author of Hebrews spoke of earlier in the book. The author of Hebrews is warning them that to go, uh, that now that Jesus has come upon the scene, now that Jesus has come upon the scene and established a new covenant in his blood, there is no more salvation to be found in the old covenant ceremony. In other words, the old covenant ceremonies only pointed to Christ. And now that Christ is here, we put our focus upon him and him alone. Furthermore, due to this, the significance that we're under a greater covenant that has been established through a greater mediator, the author encourages us to persevere and not allow compromise, not allow unbelief to rule within our lives. The author warns of the apostasy that uh, when one turns to the light that they have, that they actually receive. And, and so these, these Christians, these people who are going to church, he is very concerned for their souls. He's very concerned about what he's hearing, that some of them are going back to Judaism. And as we learned last week, there is an apostasy, and I can't tell you exactly where that line is. But there isn't a point where you apostatize and go back and there's no recovery. So the Bible talks about that. And so he's saying, you know, in other words, if you're if you're inquiring mind and saying, I just want to know where the line is, you don't want to know where the line is. You just don't want to go back. You want to stay focused on Christ. That's what the warning here in Hebrews is talking about. So go back to chapter one, because I want to hit a couple of themes about the superiority of Jesus. And if you know someone who they were in church for a long time and then they seem to be wavering roughly start showing signs of unbelief apathy coldness compromise how does the writer of hebrews deal with that he deals with it by simply showing the supremacy of jesus and so we need to show the supremacy of jesus how do you respond to someone who <clears throat> looks like maybe they're about to apostatize well you just do these things look at hebrews 1 he says, God, who at various times and various ways spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets. Was it a good thing that, that God spoke to the fathers in the past through the prophets? Absolutely. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. Right. We have a greater revelation based on the way God has spoken to us through Jesus. So as great as the old covenant revelation was through the variety of methods and speakers, the variety of men and women that he used, but now Christ has come upon the scene and we have this complete, we have a fuller understanding of the revelation of God. We have a, a brighter revelation. We're no longer looking at the shadows. We're looking at the substance, which is Christ himself. Remember what Jesus said about the Old Testament there in Luke on the road to Emmaus? He said, everything you guys were taught about the Old Testament, it was pointing towards me. 
Now that I'm here, I am the full revelation. Go to Hebrews 2, look at verse 1. Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest we drift away. For the word spoken, and, and here you kind of get a, a, a taste that there are some who are trying to drift away, aren't they? For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression of disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. See, now that we have the gospel, the gospel is being fulfilled. In the Old Testament, they were looking forward to the gospel. But even though they were looking to it, they were held accountable to the prophetic scriptures. But now that the fulfillment has come, then we are much more accountable to the way we respond to this revelation under the new covenant. Since we have this greater light, we have a greater responsibility to submit to this greater light. Turn to Hebrews 3. Look at verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all of his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. And as much as he who built the house has more honor than the house, for every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward, but Christ as the Son. See, Moses was a servant. Christ is the Son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. And here we see that Christ is greater than Moses. But notice this section deals with the unity of the old and new. And notice we see that there's this building of this house, this house of God. Moses wasn't building a separate house than Jesus was. There's not a house for the Jews and then a house for the Christians. There's only one house. Moses was a builder in the house of God, but his work was preparatory. And it's Jesus Christ who comes in as a builder to finish that house, doesn't he? Moses was a builder, but Jesus is the one who came to complete what Moses started. And Jesus is infinitely more glorious, the writer says. Jesus is not just a builder, but he's the possessor of the building. And since the house is built, the Lord God dwells with men through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now that Christ has come, the time of preparation is over, and this is what makes the new covenant more glorious than the old. Turn to Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7, look at verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Now, here we see a comparison of the priesthood of Jesus and the priesthood of Aaron. The author goes on to communicate the perfection of Jesus' priesthood. The priesthood of Jesus is an endless priesthood. Now contrast that with Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. The priesthood of Jesus was endless. Jesus' life is endless. There's endless intercession, endless effects of the atonement that Jesus provided for us once and for all. So it's better. The Levitical priesthood were symbols and shadows pointing to the reality of the priesthood and the sacrifice that Jesus would bring. Here's what I want you to take away. It is a great time to be alive today. Why? Because we live under this great priesthood. We talked about it. I skipped over it, but it was there in Hebrews 4. Because of the priestly work of Jesus Christ, we can boldly enter into the throne of grace. Remember in the old covenant, only the priest once a year could go into the Holy of Holies, but you can bid to come constantly. Are you a stranger to the throne of grace? You ever met people who claim to be Christians, but their life just looks so miserable? They're very religious. They pray, right? They probably give giving. They might even fast, but they seem lifeless, no joy. Why? But well, they're trying to do it in their own strength. They're trying to do it and at the same time be strangers to the throne of grace. You see, you can't live the kind of life Christ calls you to live and not walk in his strength. Where do you find your strength? At the throne of grace. When was the last time you were there? You've been struggling with, I, I don't understand how to walk this life that Jesus is calling you. That's the principle you're missing. You're not without strength. It's there. You just need to go. Ask for it. 
submit to it. If you've got temptations in your life that seem to just be crushing you, overwhelming you, are you taking it there? Is our Father's hand too weak to overcome any temptation that comes into your life? Not at all. Not at all. But I guarantee if you're trying to overcome your temptation in your own strength, you're failing and you're finding the Christian walk miserable. And it's not. And when I use terms like joy, blessing, bliss, excitement, it doesn't make sense to you. And it doesn't make sense to you because you're trying to do this without God's grace. Remember, the Western church has a weird idea of what grace is. They think grace is a, a grandfather winking at the sins of a child. Not at all. Couldn't be further from the truth. The grace of God is the enabling power of God to live the kind of life God calls you and I to live. And this is why we're Grace Reformed Baptist Church. We're not wink at sin Baptist Church. We are Grace Reformed Baptist Church because we believe in the re redeeming power of Jesus Christ's grace and the sustaining power of God's grace. Okay? Let me move on. Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8. So we see that, you know, what does it say? Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus' revelation is greater than that of the prophets. Jesus has got a better priesthood than that of Levi. Look at chapter 8. Look at verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that one also having something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since we are priests who offer gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed. When he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, See that you make things, all things according to the pattern shown in the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also a mediator, notice this, of a better covenant, which was established on a better promise. If you ever get a chance, go back and read through the book of Hebrews and look at the word greater, highlight the word better. You know, all this, this language to show you that Jesus Christ is better in every sense of the word. Here we see a comparison of the covenants, though. And, and here we see the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. The thing that makes this covenant so much more rich is that the old covenant could only tell us what to do. But the new covenant, in the new covenant, Jesus, through his spirit, gives us the ability to do what he commands. The law of God in the Old Testament could only command us to be righteous and holy. But it didn't forgive. The law of God doesn't forgive. The law of God doesn't show mercy when we break it. The law of God doesn't make you righteous. But in the gospel is the very revelation of the righteousness of God. Remember what Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For in it, in what? In the gospel is the very omnipotence of God. Also is the very righteousness of God. So think about the power that we possess when we go out and share the gospel. This is why in a verse earlier, Paul says, I can't wait to get to the Roman Empire, the middle of the city, to share the gospel. Why? I'm not ashamed of the very power of God and the salvation. So think about this. Each time we take the gospel of Jesus Christ to this city, we take the very omnipotence of God with us. So we should never be ashamed. But I want you to think about this. In the new covenant, what makes the new covenant new? What makes the new covenant unique? Well, one of the things that it does is the Spirit, if you go on and read here in Hebrews 8, which is quoting Jeremiah. You, know, you can go back and read Jeremiah 31. You can read Ezekiel 16. You'll see all these prophecies about what God is going to do in the new covenant. But one of the things that makes the new covenant unique is the Holy Spirit writes the law of God upon your heart. The law of God himself dwells within us. And so now we have the strength. Now you have the desire. That's what the whole new birth is about. We have a new desire to apply these righteous requirements. Look at Hebrews 9.1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared. And notice here, if you read following on this, you're going to see that what the old covenant sacrifices could not do, Christ's sacrifice could do, bring eternal redemption through his blood. Drop down to verse 11. There's a lot here. I know I'm skipping, but we've covered this in the past. But look here in verse 11. But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with the greater more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You see, the blood of bulls and goats could not provide this eternal redemption. Only the blood of the Lamb of God could do this. And so he's a perfect priest who offered a perfect sacrifice, which is himself. So over and over again, the point I'm trying to make this morning, 
Over and over again, the author has been contrasting the Old and New Covenant. And this is an important theme. So with that in mind, go back to chapter 12. <clears throat> this section here in chapter 12 lays out the superiority of the New Covenant. And he's talking about the blessings, the privileges that we have, that they're far greater to the blessings and the privileges that the Old Covenant people have. And it's because we have these blessings, because we have these privileges, we have a greater accountability before God. And that's what he's warning them of. You see, because we're under the New Covenant doesn't mean we're less accountable, but rather we're more accountable to be faithful to him. And so when you read through chapter 12, or think about when we were in, in chapter 11, and you saw their faithfulness, even though they only had the types and shadows to look at. What do you think the takeaway for us in the new covenant is, right? We're to be more faithful. We're to be more faithful. Calvin put it this way. The higher the excellency of Christ's kingdom than the dispensation of Moses, and the more glorious our calling than that of ancient people, the more disgraceful and the less excusable is our ingratitude unless we embrace in becoming manner the great favor offered to us and humbly adore the majesty of Christ, which is here made evident. And then, as God does not present himself to us clothed in terrors as he did formerly to the Jews, but lovingly and kindly invites us to himself, to the sin of ingratitude will be thus doubled, except we willingly and earnestly respond to his gracious invitation. So with that as a, a setting, let's look at uh, verse 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire and the blackness and darkness and the tempest. Now, notice here, what he's doing is he's contrasting. He's using this figurative comparison. There's a comparison between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion here. Mount Zion was the mountain of Jerusalem. And then you have Mount Sinai where the law was given. The author reminds his readers of, of all those awful things that took place around. When I say awful, I don't mean disgusting. What I mean is that it's just full of awe and majesty, right? When the Ten Commandments were given there at Mount Sinai. I mean, you ever thought about the purpose? I mean, when you look at this and you go back and read the Old Testament, you see this language about fire, the blackness, the darkness, the tempest. What, what was it for? What was the purpose? It was to get your attention, that's for sure. Because this is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And, and, and if you and I would have been there, we'd have been terrified. Because that's what the text said. They were all terrified. Look at the description. There's this blazing fire, but there's darkness at the same time. You're like, well, how can that be? I don't know if y'all ever seen like a big mountain fire. These fires they have out on the West Coast that really get big. And there's fire, but there's nothing but smoke and soot and darkness just blanketing out the sun. Well, that's what he's talking about. There was a trumpet blast. The words of the Lord were terrifying as it was coming off the mountain. It was such an event that the people begged God, would you stop speaking? But this was a holy place. Why? Because God was there. It was such a place of holiness that even if an animal touched that mountain, they were to be killed. Moses was even scared, the text says here. You think about it, Moses knew God, but this is a terrifying experience that's going on. So why? Why all this? Well, the reason why God brought the revelation in this way was to express something of the awe and the majesty of the one who's given this revelation. He wants you to understand who's given this revelation, who's given the law. In other words, um, this is not a God you want to trifle with. This is not a God you want to minimize. This is not the kind of God you put in your pocket and pull him out when you want him and then put him back when you're tired of him. That's what's being communicated here in this revelation. You see, the God that most people worship today doesn't reflect this truth at all about the God of the Bible. And here, here lies the problem of erecting a God of your own imagination. The gods we create is not one worthy of respect and it's not one worthy of reverence, is it? But the God being described here is worthy of our reverence. We need to remember that our God is a consuming fire. That's what the Bible teaches. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But this revelation is given to remind us of the inflexibility of God's law. God, due to his nature, cannot bend. God, due to his nature, cannot compromise his law. The modern church may not like that aspect of God. Or maybe they feel a little bit of embarrassment about this, this, this aspect of God's character and his nature. Uh, they might be ashamed of it, but the author of Hebrews is not ashamed of it. You ever notice that no one in the New Testament, I mean, think about what you hear a lot of these liberals and neo-Orthodox pastors and talking about today. They always feel like they got to apologize for God. No one ever in the New Testament apologized for God. Never. We don't apologize for him. He is who he is. 
He wants us to understand that he's the holy God and he is the one that we will stand before. He's the one that wants us to understand that uh, he's not going to compromise his justice for any man. The atonement of Jesus Christ makes that very clear. He will not compromise his justice for any man. All sinners will be punished without exception. And if that's the case, then what do we as sinners have for hope? Well, we have the new covenant. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But when I come to verse 18, this verse is reminding me that the mountain um, that we come to, we're not coming to a tangible mountain like Mount Zion. And we're going to talk about Mount Zion in just a moment. But in the old covenant, you either obey God or else. Right. And also think about it this way. When God gives the law to Moses, one, one noted it this way. When God gave the law to Moses, there weren't a lot of birds flying around. It wasn't a little cool breeze by a nice trickling brook. And there was no blue sky. There wasn't a bunch of people standing at the mountain saying, wow, isn't this lovely? Isn't this pleasant? Wasn't church grand today? It wasn't like that at all. No, God was letting everyone know about the character of him and the covenant he was going to establish. This is why Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 3, 7, he refers to the old covenant as administration of death. Why? You don't obey the terms. You die. And here lies the problem with those who were wanting to leave Christianity, who were wanting to leave Mount Zion and go back to Mount Sinai. That's where they were headed. Not that the law is wicked. No, the law has got straight edge. The law is a manifestation of the character of who God is. But the law, I mean, think about it. You go down the road and there's a stop sign. The law says stop, right? That stop sign doesn't have the power to make you stop. The law doesn't have the power to make you keep it. That only comes from Christ. And so what he's saying is you don't want to leave Mount Zion and go back to Mount Sinai. Kind of see what he's doing here in this text. Here our text and speaks of fire, speaks of the awful majesty of God, his inflexible judgment, the terror of his law that should strike at the heart of all who hear this. And the point here is don't fear coming to Christ, right? Come to Christ. Don't fear coming to him. Don't fear coming to Mount Zion. Don't fear coming to the mountain of grace. Don't fear that. Fear what you're going back to if you leave Christ. That's the whole point of this section. If you look at verse 19, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the word, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. We have this trumpet. A trumpet call was to, to come. A trumpet would signal, come. So there's a trumpet call to come to Sinai to assemble the people. But it was a tremendous trumpet blast to assemble the people. The trumpet was blown. The people came and they heard the voice of God. And then they cried out. Once they heard the voice of God, they stop. This is too much. We can't bear this. It's more than they can handle. They were stricken with the terror and the majesty and the voice that God brings as he brings forth his law. And, and this is what we need to keep in mind concerning the law of God. From the time it was given at Sinai to the day that is still preached today, it is reminding us of the judgment of God. And if we're not in Christ, we're going to suffer the judgment. Remember what he said earlier in Hebrews. It's appointed a man to die, then the judgment. And what's the standard by which we're going to be judged by? God's law. And so this is the image of the author. The, the author's trying to get us, uh, he's trying to impress this image in their minds that this is what you're going back to if you leave Christ. This is what you're running back to. Now, I'm going to give an overview today. And then over the next few weeks, we're going to dig into this deeper. But before you jump into the weeds, I want you to see the structures. Jump down to verse 22. So you're going to contrast all these things at Mount Sinai. And now we're going to contrast that with Mount Zion. He says in verse 22, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the just men made perfect. Now, first of all, I want you to see something. Some, as you can imagine, some commentators, I don't know how, you know, some frameworks of theology, how they can mess these things up. But I just want you to see what the text, the grammar says. And if your theology violates the grammar, then your theology is wrong. It doesn't say you will come one day to this place. It says you have come. Right? You have come to this place. This is not talking about in the future. This is talking about what happens to every Christian when they come to Christ. You have come. So who is the you? It's the body. It's the Christians that the author is writing to. The Christian has come to Mount Zion. So whatever these figures, 
Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the innumerable angels, the assembly of the firstborn, whatever these things represent is happening now. They are realities in history right now, and this is why it's better. It's a better covenant. It's not a better covenant because one day you get to enjoy these things. It's a better covenant because you get to enjoy them today. we got to figure out, well, what, what do we get to enjoy? This is the problem with salvation. Most Christians today can at least say, salvation means my sins are forgiven. And that is true. Salvation is so much more. It's so much more than just having your sins forgiven. It's having the tyranny and bondage of sin broken. You're being saved from something, but you're also being saved to something. So what are you being saved to? Here's one of the passages that tells you what Christians are saved to. And I hope as you hear this this morning, if you have this inkling of a thought that the wicked are so intimidating, I hope I dismiss every bit of that. There's nothing they can bring against you. Once you understand where you are now, who you are in Christ, why would you ever allow the wicked to intimidate you? So let's look at this. You see on Mount Zion, we don't see God's wrath. We see God's mercy, love, grace. On Mount Zion, we have the people who have fled from God's wrath. They fled to Jesus, which is God's provision. You see, the, the reason why we can go and experience and enjoy Mount Zion is because Christ experienced the wrath of God for us. So when we read the Bible, there are two distinct parts. And the second part is vastly more glorious than the first. This doesn't mean that the first part, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant is not true. But rather, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament is preparatory for a more glorious New Covenant, which is a picture. So keep in mind that this revelation of the New Covenant is just as awe-inspiring as the revelation at Mount Sinai. Because what we see here is a revelation of God's justice, His mercy, it's all being brought together. And in His mercy... And justice, God's great salvation is displayed. So when I read verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion. You have come. All right. So when we see this, you have come. And if you're a believer uh, in Christ, these realities are for you right now. You and I have come to Mount Zion. The moment God opens our eyes, the moment he gives us the new birth, the moment we embrace Christ as our Savior, all these things are true to us now. And notice you have come to Mount Zion. You have also come to the city of the living God. Now, the author already pointed out this city earlier. Go back to Hebrews 11. Let me just point this out to you. Hebrews 11. Look at uh, verse 9. By faith he, talking about Abraham, dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob and the heirs of him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Look at verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, this is the vision of Abraham. Every time he built a tent, every time he built an altar, every time he had a child, all this was the fulfillment of the great promise that God would one day build a city upon this earth. An eternal city whose foundation was based upon God. God is the one who builds it. God is the one who sustains the city. God is the one who fills it with himself and with his people. And this is important to grasp. Think about it from Abraham's perspective for just a moment, right? Think about the readers of Hebrews. From their perspective, everything, humanistically speaking, seemed very bleak. Think about Abraham, for example. What does Abraham mean? Father of many nations. And every time he walked up, somebody, they're walking around there in the wilderness, and they pass another group of nomads coming through, and they say, hey, what's your name? Oh, I'm Abraham. Oh, that means father of many nations. Where are all your kids? Well, I don't have them yet. But see, every time he spoke that name, he was proclaiming what God said would be, would be. And so this is what he's doing. He's looking forward to the city that God would build. And the city that Abraham was looking for is the city that we're members of. So what is this city? What is this city of the living God that the author of Hebrews talks about? It is the accomplishment of the kingdom of God on earth. When we as members of his bodies, we are citizens of that kingdom. This is the city of God that is filled with God. This is in contrast with the city of man that is built by man and opposes the city of God. So what's the distinctive nature of this city? What makes the city of God unique and distinctive? It's that God dwells there. What distinguishes this city from the city of man is that this is where God dwells. The city of man does not want God to dwell. 
The city of God is where God dwells. This is where God blesses his people. This is where God builds his people. This is a glorious thought when you compare the picture of Mount Sinai. So when you read verse 22, think of this society of God upon earth. We are forgiven, peaceful society on earth. We are a society that sinners can come and find refuge in Christ. I mean, this is why, like a lot of the early pilgrims, when they came here, they wanted America to be a light set upon a hill. This is the great society. This is what the author wants us to grasp. What an infinitely greater blessing it is to be saved from hell. But here's the thing. As great as a blessing as it is to be saved from hell, it is infinitely greater blessing to know God. And that's what the people of God who are in the city of God get to know. Throughout the rest of our Christian life, we're going to live in this great society. Notice the next phrase here. He says that you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. And once again, if you're struggling with this, Make sure your theology is not in contrast with the grammar. Because I know a lot of people in this area don't like what I say. I know they don't understand and appreciate the fact that this is a living reality now. We're not waiting for the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is here, right? How does this kingdom expand? Through the gospel proclamation. What is the kingdom of heaven? It's the rule and reign of Jesus Christ in the heart of all his people. And as he rules and reigns in their heart, they're going to bring this dominion to their culture. We're going to submit to King Jesus in all areas of our lives. And the world's going to know this. The world's going to know this. They're going to know where the city of God is. They're going to know where this godly society is. Now, I think in our country, our, our nation is having a hard time because where are they? Where is the salt and light in this world? Where is the salt and light in our culture and our community? They used to be there. They used to permeate and dominate didn't mean they were the majority. It just means they permeated and dominated culture at one time. So we are members of this city of God. Now notice what he says here. But you come to Mount Zion, you have done this, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now what is this? Well, the heavenly Jerusalem tells us a lot about the nature of salvation. What was Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, which was a theocracy. Jerusalem is the capital where the king presided. Jerusalem was the center of worship for the people of God. Jerusalem was also a fortress for the people of God. In other words, it was a city of security. So whenever enemies would come and attack the people of God in Israel, they would seek refuge in Jerusalem. So this is salvation in Christ. This salvation in Christ is, is said to be the heavenly Jerusalem. So what Jerusalem was literally, what Jerusalem was geographically, this is what salvation is to the people of God in the new covenant. The heavenly Jerusalem is where we worship God. The heavenly Jerusalem is where God dwells with his people, where we find refuge and deliverance. Where is the temple of God these days? Where is the temple of God? Where God dwells. It's not in a location. It's in a people. And just as there's a, a, a palace in the city where the king dwells, well, the king dwells with us now. God governs our lives, and through us, he governs the world. As God rules and reigns within our lives, he's taking dominion of the world. The heavenly Jerusalem is a picture that God has reconciled himself to sinners who have been redeemed to the king. In the old covenant, Jerusalem was the center of the worship of God. Ask yourself today, where is the center of worship now in this earth? It's with us. And wherever the people of God meet, wherever the people of God meet is the center of the worship of God. Why? Because God dwells within his people. God dwells within the heavenly Jerusalem. So everywhere the people go in this earth, they find the people who are reconciled by the blood of the Lamb and they worship God. And this is what unbelievers should be seeing. What protects you from the fiery darts of your wicked enemy? The fact that God is your refuge. He protects us from the wicked one. This, for example, is why you can never be plucked from his hand. This is why you can never be separated from his great love. Now, once again, as you can imagine, there are different views about this heavenly Jerusalem. Some get held up on this word heavenly. But this word heavenly is not referring to location. The word heavenly refers to origin. You understand the difference? This Jerusalem is not sourced or built by man, but it's sourced in God. You remember when Jesus was there before Pilate and he said, my kingdom is not of this world? And when he makes that statement, many people interpret that as saying, well, this kingdom has nothing to do with worldly things. In other words, the kingdom of God is not interested in politics. The kingdom of God is not interested in art or work or economics. It's only concerned with people going to heaven. And when they die, 
because this kingdom is not of this world. That's all it's really focused upon. But that's not true at all. That's not what it means. When Jesus makes this statement that his kingdom is not of this world, he's not making about a statement about the character of the kingdom, but its origins. When Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world, he's making it clear that his kingdom originated from another place. And so when Pilate asked if he was a king, he said yes, and that his kingdom was coming. This is why in Psalm 2, when the father looks to the son and says, ask of me of the nations and I'll give you them for an inheritance. So we have to ask the question. Did Jesus ask for the nations as an inheritance? Yes. When? At the Great Commission. When he comes back, the resurrected Lord says, all authority in heaven has been given to me. Is that what he said? No, it says all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go based upon that authority. You go and you make disciples of the nations. Does he want the nations? You better believe he does. There is inheritance. They belong to him. How do we do it? It's not like the 82nd Airborne dropping out in parachutes and dropping bombs on people. It's none of that nonsense. It is simply by taking the message of the king. The message, you know, that Paul says we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ and we have this message of reconciliation bringing peace between God and man. That's how you overcome the world. That's how you overcome the world. When Jesus says that his kingdom is not of this world, he's just making it clear his kingdom originated from another place. So, since his kingdom does not originate with man, then the schemes of man, the plots, the strategies of man just cannot grow it. And so we need to go back to the law word of the king and understand how to live within this kingdom. And so when our text talks about a heavenly Jerusalem that we all come to, it's not talking about where it's located. Rather, what it's talking about is its origin. The heavenly Jerusalem is not something we produce by our own hands. It's something that God does. And so if we're to be reconciled with God, if we're to have peace with him, then it's going to be by him, by his grace. You notice the next phrase. This one's interesting to me. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. And it's interesting. That word, some of your translations may have this word myriad, but in the Greek it literally means millions upon millions of angels. You see, there's two types of heavenly people, beings within in this Jerusalem, unfallen angels and redeemed man. And what do they do? What do these what do these myriads of angels do? Well, they celebrate. Right? They celebrate. Remember, when one sinner, just one sinner repents, Jesus says, so much celebration in the heavenly realm, right? But here's another thing. You and I need to take angels seriously. Why? Because the Bible does. Listen. When you think about angels, do you think of little fat babies with little wings that how in the world these little wings pick them up? Do you think precious moments, figurines? Is that what you think of when you think of angels? Well, here's the thing. Wipe that out of your head. Angels are ministry spirits. They're created beings. They have capabilities that we don't have. Our text says there's millions of these angelic beings that God uses. And as you read through the scriptures, you see they protect people. They help advance his kingdom. Here's the thing. You remember... Um, the myriad of angels, do you remember, for example, in the Old Testament, when Elisha was there and the king of Syria came against Elisha? Remember, Elisha could see and figure out the plots and plans of the king, and he kept disrupting them, and, and the people around the king says, you know, it was Elisha. Elisha. So he sent a whole army down there to get this one prophet. And the servant of Elisha woke up and was like, the city is surrounded. And, of course, Elisha doesn't. He didn't get his feathers ruffled. He takes a look out there and. He prays that God would open the eyes of this poor servant who's just freaking out. And the servant sees something, doesn't he? And what does he see? You know what Elisha tells him? Those who are with us far outnumber those who are against us. And that's the principle we need to remember. God uses them. God uses them. Does God need those angels? No, but it appears that you and I do. God uses them for our protection. So when I go to the difficult places to minister, and it seems like it's me and there's a bunch of others against me, opposing me. My confidence is not in my strength. My confidence is that I'm under the protection of God. I've been sent. I've been sent out with a commission to bring the gospel, even to a hard, vile people. Here's the thing, though. Watch for the activity of angels in your life. Don't forget this principle, right? God would use them to give the people of God victory when the odds seem to be so much against them. And here's the thing, when you see something in your life that seems so overwhelming, how am I going to get out of this? And then there's a way made. Look for these activities, these angels in your life. 
It's a great blessing of salvation, though, when you think about it. And when you come, oh, it's a blessing to come to Mount Zion. Oh, it's a blessing to come to the city of the living God. It's a blessing to be in the heavenly Jerusalem. And it's a blessing to know that God has all these people back in Europe. I, I, I mean, we just have no idea how many times they protect this. But look back to your life. Sit and think about it. Think about the great victories that God has accomplished in your life. You can probably see their activity. They've been involved. Something took place in your life, you can't explain it. But never forget this principle. Never forget this fact. You're surrounded by myriads of God's angelic hosts. It seems to me that the author wants us to know they come with our salvation. Well, look at the next phrase. He says, But you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Now notice this. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Well, we're part of the general assembly of the firstborn. Our salvation in Christ makes us members of this general assembly. Now, what does this word general assembly mean? This word in the Greek has several ideas that I think drives home the point of what the author is trying to get us to understand. This Greek word would have been had this idea of political convention. Uh, when all the cities, citizens in a city state would come together to make decisions, the general assembly was also seen as a court where members of the court would render judicial decisions. A general assembly in the Greek is a meeting of commissioners whose duty it is to conduct the business at hand and to carry out the order of the head of state. It's a working committee that has responsibility to execute the order that had been assigned to them. And so the author is telling us that the church of Jesus Christ is a general assembly. We are an assembly of redeemed people who are to be about the business of executing the demands of our king. In other words, we're not just here to go through religious emotions today and then tomorrow return back to worldly activity. No, we're a general assembly who come together to worship the king and then go into the world to carry out his plan for dominion. You see, the world outside the general assembly, that world outside, those people we know who are lost, they need to be brought into the general assembly by God's grace. They need redemption, don't they? He has not called us to a ministry of apathy while those around us perish, but rather as the General Assembly, he has given us the marching orders. As the General Assembly, we're to execute those marching orders. Did you say, Pastor, but what if our countrymen, our fellow countrymen hate what we do? What if our countrymen tell us they don't want us to do that? Well, the author says you're not the General Assembly of the wicked. You're the General Assembly and the firstborn. You belong to Christ. You're, you're, you have a responsibility to carry out the, the will of the king, not those who are perishing in their sins. The unbelieving world does not dictate the duty of the general assembly. Paul in Ephesians 5, for example, tells us not to have any fellowship with darkness, but to expose them. So our desire is that since God has given us the keys to the kingdom, he's given the keys of the kingdom to the church, we desire that we open up the kingdom to those who would repent and turn to Christ in faith. And let me just ask you this. When you read this text, do you think this is just for the pastor to do? It doesn't say the pastor's the general assembly. All of us, you and I both, are part of the general assembly. And so the church, we don't see this going on to our day. We don't think, the church doesn't think much about this. They don't think about this at all. They've forgotten that they're the general assembly. As a result, we've just become big social clubs. We, we've allowed the culture to influence us. We've allowed the culture to intimidate us. Uh, they, many churches, unfortunately, have become apathetic to the desire of their king, and they've allowed the darkness to overcome this once enlightened nation. The only institution that can give moral direction to the culture is the General Assembly of the Firstborn. We can't look to our government to do it. We certainly can't look to these people who don't know Christ to give us moral direction. And if we are silent, if we refuse to execute the role of the General Assembly, if we are intimidated into silence, then our culture will die. And here's the thing. Go ahead. Just write it down. Just write this down. Go ahead and be ready to be called a bigot, judgmental, self-righteous. Go ahead and write that out and get it out of your system because that's what they're going to say about you when you go out to the culture and share the truth of God's word. But be ready to respond. Be ready to respond. But we never allow the wicked to intimidate us into silence. Why? We don't want to see our culture die. See if like we're in a death spiral. But what do we do when we go out and engage culture? That's what we do. 
This is, this, this is one of the reasons God saved us. He saved us so that we might be the court and assembly that gives direction to our age and show them how to enter into this grand kingdom, this heavenly city, this heavenly Jerusalem. How will they enter in? What does Paul say? How will they know unless a preacher goes and tells them? We got to go tell them. We're the general assembly. Think about this. If we don't give direction to this age, the secularist, the humanist, the wicked, they'll give direction. You see, if we don't call good good and evil evil, the humanist is going to go out and proclaim their message that good is evil and evil is good. Our land could use some direction. Our land could use some general assembly of the firstborn to engage it, to embrace it. I'm not talking about embrace their ways, but embrace the culture, engage the culture with the truth of God's word. And here's the thing. Think about how divided and, and how disordered we've become even in the church. We've divided things into a left-right issue. You see, abortion is not a left issue. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. Bankrupting the country due to inflationary policy that is just robbing you from your wealth. It's not a left issue. It's not a right issue. It's just wrong. Taking wealth from one and redistributing it to another is not a left issue. It's just wrong. To refuse to punish the wicked is not a left issue. It's just wrong. And as the General Assembly, we are called to speak to our representatives, to educate our culture about what is right and wrong. Are you beginning to understand your role now as a church? It's a little bit more than just coming here, isn't it? We're to be the church, not just here, but outside this place. We're to be the General Assembly. Well, here's another phrase. I love this. Not only are you the General Assembly, but you're the church of the firstborn. You're the people of God who have been called out of the world and formed into one body. And in the Greek, the word firstborn is plural. The church is made up of the firstborn. Well, who are they? Well, this language takes us back to the Old Testament idea of the firstborn. The firstborn was the heir of everything of the Father. And so when the author uses this language of the firstborn for the church, it's just another way of saying you're special to God. There's something special about the firstborn in the Old Testament. Now, I know here today we're supposed to say we love all of our children equally and all that, and I'm sure you do. But there was something in the Old Testament that was special about the firstborn. There are certain privileges given to him. And you know what you and I are? In God's eye, we're the church of the firstborn with those privileges given to us. Firstborn privileges, firstborn status. It's not just given to me, but given to you as well. This means, based on our firstborn status, this is why Paul would say in Romans that we are co-heirs with Christ. I hope that encourages you today. I hope that encourages you. When the world looks at you, looks down at you, don't, doesn't think much of you, just remember this. Church of the firstborn. I'm special not because of anything in me. I'm special because God redeemed me. God made me the church of the firstborn. And the church, you know, this author is laying out to this persecuted group. They needed to hear this. They needed to be reminded of this truth. Those who are threatening to go back to Judaism. They're threatening to leave Mount Zion and go back to Mount Sinai and give all of this stuff. Finally, we see this phrase enrolled in heaven, cities, schools, counties, states. Even churches have rosters and roles, but so does heaven. God chose us before the foundation of the world, and our name is on this roll, and so it can never be lost. This is why Jesus would say, for example, in John 6, doesn't he say this? All that the Father gives to me will what? Will come to me. It's going to happen. And I will lose none of them, but raise them all up on the last day. There's your hope. There's your security. So when God writes your name down, it can't be removed. All believers who are in Christ have their name written in heaven. And, and this is what encourages me. The people in my state may not know who I am, but God knows me. God knows me. From, from how long? From the foundation of the world. And here's another thing. You and I are secure as we will be a million years from now. Never lose confidence in the words of Jesus Christ. I'm running along, but let me just finish this up. He says, talks about the God, the judge of all. And notice this didn't change from the old to the new. He still is the judge. And then he talks about the spirits of the righteous who are made perfect. Notice this in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is like, wouldn't, wouldn't want to come near to the mountain. The one, uh, the Old Testament Jew would not draw near as we as Christians get to draw near. We get to draw near Mount Zion. We boldly draw near to him with this firstborn status. And we see that God is our judge, but he's our father as well. 
And because he's our father, we have access to him any time due to the work of Jesus. So when the judge of all the earth comes to judge the wicked, the wicked are going to try to flee and run, but not the children of God, not the firstborn. Why? Because as the children of the firstborn, we draw to, we desire to draw near to this, this judge. Everyone on the else on the earth tries to suppress the truth and unrighteousness and fight to suppress the truth of God. But the children of Mount Zion, the children of the firstborn, always draw near to him. And then notice here the final phrase I just want to hit on, and then we'll pick up this little wheel next week. Notice we have come, past tense, to the spirit of righteous men made perfect. So who does this refer to? Who are the spirits of the righteous men made perfect? Well, it refers to all the people of God from the very beginning of time who had their faith in the promises of God, faith in the provision of God, who is the author and finisher of our faith. These are the ones who are absent from the body, but now are at home with God, and they are perfected in holiness. And here's the beautiful thing about what the author is trying to communicate. We are part of that same body. We are part of that same church. We are part of that same general assembly. You and I are part of the same body of those who went before us. The same God that perfected them is the same Father who will perfect us. The same God that presented them and brought them safely home is the same God who will preserve you as well. I need to stop here, but let me just remember the context. Some of these went through some fiery trials, and God still brought them home safely. There's your hope. There's your confidence is in that God. We're going to cover more in this section. It's a great section, but let me just stop here. I want you to think and meditate upon what we've talked about this morning. Remember, this is a warning section. The whole section is warning that don't leave this grand, glorious state that you find yourself in. The author is warning against the dangers of living, leaving Mount Zion. Remember, he's not writing to atheists. He's writing to people just like you and me. And it's always hard. I don't know everything that's going on in your life, right? How Satan's trying to crush you. What pressures are coming into your life. So I may not be able to speak specifically to your situation today, but God's word can. Remember, these people were being taken home, drug out of their homes, drug out of churches, prevented from doing business in the community, being put in prison. Saul of Tarsus was breathing threats down their neck before he became saved. Remember what he was doing? And the author of Hebrews is saying, listen, you put your confidence in the reality that you are the church of the firstborn. You are part of that assembly that God perfected. He perfected them in the past. He'll perfect you despite what's going on around you. Don't go back to Mount Sinai. Why? Well, there's no sacrifice for sin in the old covenant now that Christ has come. The author's reminding them you can't find any rest except in Christ. And think about all those. There were some who apostatized. There are some who left. They left Mount Zion. They went back to Mount Sinai. What did they find? What actually happened to them? Well, in 70 AD, they all perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. And then if they stepped into eternity, they tasted eternal destruction. And all those who did not trust in the all-sufficient sacrifice of Jesus Christ, they experienced everything that's pictured there in Mount Sinai. Since they rejected the grace and mercy of God, they experienced this, the severity of God. The authors pleaded with these persecuted Christians by showing them the superiority of Christ and his covenant. And so, Lord willing, next week, we're going to focus more on the superiority of the new covenant. But let's not forget that this section speaks to us today as well. Because we have such a great responsibility. If those who were under the old covenant had the responsibility before God and were held accountable, then how much more responsibility do we have? We have the full revelation of the king. We have his orders. We have his instructions. We have our duty to what is applied. We have to apply what we've learned. Here's the thing. We have a spirit. We have everything we need to accomplish what he told us to accomplish. But we have more responsibility. Here's the glorious thing. He's given us his spirit to accomplish his will. We have so many more privileges than the old covenant community. Remember, only the high priest could go before the Holy of Holies, but we're under the new covenant, and we're told, let's just boldly go. Don't let it be too long. If it's been a while since you've been there, don't let, don't let it be too long next time. Since we're a people of great privilege and we have the great responsibility to serve him, the greater responsibility to worship him, to praise him, to thank him. Have you done that this week? Did you praise him and thank him? Have you considered the privileges that you have under the new covenant? I hope just this taste, because we're going to dig into this deeper, I hope this taste helps you understand the function and role of the church. We've lost that in this country. The church today, many times, and we need to be asking ourselves, are we guilty of this here? What of these elements are we not applying within our church here? We're
Where have we been corrupted? Where have we been influenced by culture? Where do we need the word of God to enlighten our minds with respect to this ascent? We're to be the general assembly of the first point. And as we go through this section, let's take time over the next few weeks to thank God for his great plan of salvation and all of those benefits that we get to enjoy. If I introduced you to some new concepts today about the nature of salvation and the benefits you get, go and study it out. And as you study it, thank God for those benefits. So may God grant each and every one of us the mercy to have the proper sense of gratitude. I hope you also get a bigger sense of who Jesus is and he's been magnified in your mind today. So that when you walk out of this door, you have a sense of more adoration for him than you did when you walked in here. Our Father and our God, we come before you this day. This is a great day. We got to learn about you. We got to hear about you and your word. We got to hear about what you've accomplished in this earth through your son. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen each and every one of us. Help us to examine our own hearts to see where we're falling short, where we're not living in accordance to your will. So, Father, prepare, strengthen us today for the great uh, duties that you've given us, the great responsibilities that you've given to us. I pray that today we might see King Jesus in his splendor, his glory, that we might see him as better, greater. This is the offer of Hebrews intended us for us to see him. So, Father, we thank you for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his work in our lives. We thank you what he's doing through us and into us, through this church, in this community. Father, help us to be bold. Help us not to hide our light. May we not hide our light under a bushel. But may we shine it brightly for all to see. So, Father, help us. Protect us from the snares of Satan, his schemes, his ways of trying to get us to ruin our, our credibility, our testimony. Father, uphold each and every one of us here. Father, we pray that you dismiss us with your blessing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.